Hey guys. Um, is this on? Yes. Great, thanks. Uh, so this is the Hacks of Aggression panel. Um, I'm very excited to get started today. And I am a little flustered because I'm running late, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves so I have no chance of mangling their names. <laughs> uh, I'm Stuart Geiger. I'm an ethnographer and postdoc at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. Hi, I'm Nabil. I'm uh, doing a PhD in Gothenburg University, Sweden. Uh, I'm Natalie Kane. I do some weird stuff with futures and art in Manchester. And I'm Megan Farnell. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Alberta. So let's just go in order down the line. Is that okay? Yeah. Or does the microphone? Okay. Sure. Great. And then everybody has 12 minutes, and I will give you time with these cards and. All right. Great. Let me pull this up. How do I present on a Mac? I'm sorry, I don't, F5 doesn't. Uh, yeah, you probably. Hold on, oh, you're in system preferences right oh. now. Okay. <laughs> oh, there it is, uh, present. Okay, awesome. Um, kind of like walk around a little bit, so I'm making myself a little, <laughs> little space. Um, hi everybody, I'm Stuart Geiger, and I'm gonna be talking to you today about uh, a project that I did um, Starting about a year ago, uh, uh, it, about sort of moderating twi harassment in Twitter with block bots, uh, and I'm gonna just sort of sort of get to it. But it's also part of a paper that was very recently published, and that I'm not going to be able to cover all of it in 12 minutes. It's an information communication society, so the stuff I don't get to. Uh, the, if you're interested, you can read it there. I created a tiny URL slash ICS dash block bot. I'll also post a link to that on on Twitter if you're interested. The itinerary for this, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got involved in this research, which sort of sets the stage theoretically for how I'm thinking about algorithms as code and law, uh, thinking about the moderation of, of network publics through, uh, through, through software, uh, give an introduction to what these block bots are in Twitter and how they came about, um, some sort of uh, some conclusions and some, some thoughts on uh, counter publics, classification, and delegation. Uh, and then sort of end by sort of talking with a little bit about block bots versus the filter bubbles concept that's sort of very prevalent in discussions about um, algorithms and publics. But before I begin, I just want to take a quick sort of straw poll. Um, how many of, these, the, uh, of you in the room are familiar with block bots, auto blockers, block together, things like this? Okay, so some of you, but not all of you. So, um, to get, to, so to get started about how I got uh, started working on this particular topic, it wasn't about harassment on Twitter. I was actually studying the governance of Wikipedia for my dissertation. Wikipedia is, according to Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia that anyone can edit. Um, that anyone can edit feature creates a whole bunch of problems because anyone can do anything and they do. Um, and so a lot of the people who talk about Wikipedia, uh, who are commenters, often talk about a supposed wisdom of crowds in a very techno-libertarian um, uh, way that, oh, we don't need any rules, we don't need any governments, we just get people together, and they will sort of spontaneously build something that's really beautiful. It turns out that's actually bullshit. Um, it, Wikipedia is actually governed more by a wisdom of bots, where there are a substantial amount of hierarchies and rules and norms and structures that are built into the infrastructure um, that do a lot of work on quality control, counter harassment, counter vandalism and things like that um, to make the thing that we all know and love actually work. <coughs> now for bots, why I think bots are really interesting is because with an API or an application programming interface, bots can log into a typical user account and do typically everything that a human user can do. So if you can edit, it can edit. If you can tweet, it can tweet. If you can block someone, it can block someone on your behalf. And this is the way that a lot of really interesting interactions start to happen as people start to delegate different kinds of governance work and moderation work to bots instead of doing it manually themselves through their own user accounts. And so if it's an ordinary user account, it's limited to the things that an ordinary user can do. But if you're talking about an administrative account, um, then you can delegate, you can have a bot that logs into that admin account and actually takes more substantive uh, measures. So this is something that's also used very prevalently in Reddit, so auto moderator bot is something that's used on a variety of subreddits, especially the large ones to sort of help the moderator, help the more human moderators do a lot of work. And I look at this sort of uh, with, uh, with something that I call bespoke code that's very interesting because Wikipedia and Reddit and also what I'm going to be talking about in Twitter are interesting because their gatekeeping algorithms are typically developed and operated by volunteers 
not the people who own and operate the servers. They're running these bots on their own personal computers or servers or servers they have access to, and that actually really changes the, 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 the power dynamics. Instead of having the people who are officially part of the, of, of the Wikimedia Foundation or Twitter Inc. or Condé Nast at Reddit make decisions about what's going to actually have to uh, moderate it, with moderation bots, you have that sort of a more decentralized form. And so I'm just going to skip through a couple a little bit. And this, um, and then I got, so, I'll just for time, I got interested in this, uh, in, in sort of online harassment issues because the Gamergator showed up in my turf Wikipedia. Um, and if you don't know what Gamergate, it, Gamergate is, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> and, and then sort of I, as, as someone on Twitter, I started to actually see this sort of unfold on Twitter as well. And please don't tweet the hashtag. It'll cause a whole bunch of nasty people to come in here. Um, and I was looking around and I was seeing a whole bunch of similar dynamics in terms of you have an open platform like in Wikipedia. You have a lot of people who can do anything. In Twitter, anyone can contact anyone else by default. Um, there's a lot of sort of open by, de open by default and the assumption that that's going to sort of lead to this really awesome uh, the public sphere in which, you know, the, the sort of excellent public discourse and conclusions and thoughts about how society should be run is going to precipitate out of that sort of almost lack of structure. Um, and again, yeah, that doesn't happen. That's kind of... Um, and so one of the things that I've been interested in and, and started to look at was blocking in Twitter. And the problem with blocking is that it's an individual thing. Um, and with... And what I sort of started to saw with sort of a lot of sort of coordinated harassment movements is that the work of harassment is easily distributed. You can have someone who identifies a target and post it to an anonymous Im image board and then have a whole bunch of people who are able to take a very small amount of work and collectively that ends up in a really traumatic experience for the target. However, the work of responding to harassment is a more individualized task. And specifically the way that the affordances are built into Twitter around blocking make it so that it's, it's uh, for a long time was only something that you could do one on one. It could, and it was something that if you were receiving harassment on Twitter, you could block someone, but that wasn't going to go anywhere. That work was, uh, of identifying a harasser and taking action against it uh, was only going to take effect for you. Hence the creation, this spurred the instigation and the creation of block bots, which were a way to pool these resources together from people who were facing the same kinds of harassment from the same kinds of people, and they could curate shared block lists. So at their core, what block bots are, are information infrastructures that, th that support third party, that is off-site, not controlled by Twitter, Inc., block bots, um, that are, sorry, block lists that are community curated. So people get together and they have a common understanding of what they think harassment is and how to, how, uh, how to identify it and how to curate a block list, or they think they have that, and that gets interesting, I'll talk about it in a second, when those communities fracture. Um, but then they go out and they, they build an a automated software agent where you can subscribe to this block bot. And when you subscribe to a block bot, it works very similarly to ad blocking from a user experience perspective. But in this case, an automated software agent or a bot logs into your Twitter account, um, and it blocks all accounts on that collective block list for you. And there's also other different ways that different block bot communities have where people can submit new accounts to the block list. So some of the popular ones that, be, that you may be familiar with are things like the block bot, uh, blocktogether.org is a general purpose block bots as a service model, um, and the so sort of automated GG auto blocker bot, um, which is based on a social network graph of people in the, uh, uh, based on a social network graph of sort of ringleaders of, of a particularly sort of uh, nasty group that won't be, be named. Um, and so one of the things uh, that I was looking at in this research was how are these blo block bot based block lists curated? And I found a really interesting thing where uh, one of the great, one of the sort of really fascinating things about this particular approach to distributed moderation is that a, one of these block, block bots can, the block list can be curated through any given socio-technical system, by which I mean any combination of a third party offsite platform that, that people make for themselves and a set of rules and practices that they have of how to use that platform to generate a list of block worthy accounts. So you can do anything from a single person that they just decide who is and isn't, isn't block worthy by themselves, and they maintain that sometimes on their own personal Twitter account. Sometimes it's a tight-knit group whose members share very common ideas and often have known each other for a long time. Sometimes it can it turn into a bureaucracy where there are for, formalized standards and processes, well-defined rules, definitions, examples, procedures, appeals processes. Sometimes they're automated processes using things like natural language processing to identify hashtags or network analysis. 
Um, there could even be, and I haven't actually seen one of these in the wild, but uh, a crowdsourced system where anyone could contribute to a block list. I, I wrote up some code just sort of as a speculative manner that you could, you could use a, a wiki to, to generate a block list or even a subreddit to generate a block list. These are very modular practices where people can swap in and out different ideas and different platforms about how to, how to curate this list of block-worthy accounts. And in the paper, I analyze this through the, through the lens of counterpublics, which is Nancy, which is a, and this is a, the cover of uh, Michael Warner's book, Publics and Counterpublics, which is great. Uh, I took a draw a lot from Nancy Fraser's work on counterpublics, where, um, where, where she talks about how a uh, similar kind of assumption that I talked about with Wikipedia and Twitter and then the sort of techno-neo-libertarian idea that, oh, we have a public and everyone will be able to contribute. Um, and then it turns out that that sort of chills a lot of voices. A lot of people are drowned out. Not everyone has an equal voice. And hence, we have sort of counterpublics that we see counterpublics that form where alternative voices are sort of uh, can be recognized. And the more sort of like safe spaces for people to to, uh, to sort of create the uh, and, and engage in discourse more on their own terms. Counterpublics are not new. Nancy Fraser talks about about them um, as they as they arose sort of in early modern Europe. These are things that we've talked about, we've had for centuries, and I think it's really important to bring in this history when thinking about how we curate uh, a networked public sphere. But one of the interesting things about block bots is that traditionally counterpublics are Fraser calls them parallel discursive arenas, independent safe spaces, separated from the dominant public, um, and you know uh, and you know, for for, the, for people who are often marginalized or chilled in mainstream publics, but. One of the things about blockbots is that instead of creating an entirely new space where you would sort of selectively approve allies and trusted members to come in with, with special, specialized norms, blockbots involve sort of selectively disapproving certain individuals or groups, um, which is something that is typically considered, uh, has been the privilege of the server sovereign, the person who runs the public sphere, the person who runs the platform on which the public sphere happens. So we're seeing sort of a fragmentation or sort of a mirroring um, of, uh, of, of, the, of, a, of a network public, as opposed to the creation of an entirely separate network public. And classification is hard and never perfect, and I really want to emphasize this. Classifying harassment is probably one of the hardest things, hard, hardest challenges on the internet today. And a lot of people are really interested in doing this and, and trying to do a lot of work from different perspectives. Um, the problem is no one, there is no one can canonical definition of what harassment is, nor, and I don't think that there should be. Different people have different ideas about what's going on and what they want to see and what kind of content um, they have. And there's been a, and, and, and the creation of these, uh, these different uh, ideas about what harassment is, um, is a very ongoing social political process. I don't think we should shy away from that. I think we should embrace the fact that classification is messy and difficult, and, and it sort of speaks to people's life worlds about what's important to them, where they come from, and what's going on. So um, I'll sort of skip forward because I'm getting a little bit there. Um, there's been a whole bunch of block block controversies that have happened, even among people who are like-minded, who think they have the same idea of what harassment is, but it turns out when they put that into practice, they have some different ideas. Sometimes they, they fracture according to a lot of different, uh, lot, 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 lot of, a lot of different uh, ways. Sometimes it's political. Sometimes it's procedural. Um, sometimes it can be, be personality conflicts. Um, but I think that uh, the blockbot ecosystem and infrastructure is at only be, only beginning. And as this sort of technique and strategy for distributed moderation grows, we're going to be seeing a lot more different sort of communities and subcommunities and publics. Um, so I'm out of time. I don't want to sort of create that. I don't, don't want to take too much time. But if you want to read the paper, I tweeted the link to that. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention. Did everyone hear that okay? All right. Good afternoon. Uh, well, uh, this title is a bit uh, confusing sometimes uh, as it uh, gives an impression that it's a journey. Like whoever produces a sex step or sex, they will end up in uh, revenge porn. Uh, but that's not the case, of course. But some, there is a debate uh, concerning uh, these practices. In one hand, we have a liberatory uh, view that this is a consensual act between partners. Uh, it's, it can uh, give uh, 
liberation to people who can uh, use alternative uh, mediums and they can uh, participate in sexual activities, different alternative uh, uh, pleasure. But it, it is private. It is meant to be private. It's between both men and women. And particularly for women, it's about agency uh, that they can self-determine whether they will uh, participate in, in these activities and, and how they will participate. On the other hand, uh, revenge body is a non-consensual distribution of intimate images. And media, uh, according to media reports, sometimes it is uh, projected that the inter internet is a very dangerous site for women. And uh, it's, of course, violation of privacy. It brings humiliation and sexual shaming for people. And it also, there is a gender bias according to media report that it's uh, more affecting women and sometimes we have a tendency to blame the victim uh, that they are the ones who started this in the first place and now they are into revenge porn uh, so no one else to blame but much recently uh, Jessica Ringros has uh, suggested that uh, it is the discourses that have specific value on both online and offline world. And based on those discourses, uh, it can be both liberating or uh, it can be liberating or victimizing or both. So I was interested in uh, how do discourses like gender, sexuality, and power affect the construction of revenge porn on the internet. And my focus was on the production and display of revenge porn content and the vision and visuality it creates for the audience. And I, I just borrowed this methodological concept from Niels, who's also here present. So for my case study, uh, I chose a website called myx.com. If I'm, I'm the only visitor in this website, <laughs> I'll just give you some uh, characteristics from, from it. You can see you know, there are different type of, uh, type of uh, di uh, display technologies, like uh, profile picture, thumbnails, uh, personal uh, information, then a sh story in the end, uh, down below. Uh, you can see there where the perpetrator or the person who is posting this, uh, he is giving a story, you know, why he or she is taking this revenge and what wrong the victim has done to him or her. And this uh, website gives particular uh, instructions how to do that. Uh, you see uh, there are uh, personal informations and then uh, they ask for social networking site uh, that the person is using and then the story and you know in the end the naked uh, pictures or photos they can upload mostly uh, in the website I found that it's the uh, US citizens who are being exposed but it can also reach uh, European citizens and far away in Asia but they are not the majority. So I'll just give you some uh, basic characteristics uh, in descriptive facts. Like I found that uh, I collected 100 uh, posts and 88% of the sample revenge porn posts exposed women. And they contained uh, semi-nude or you know, full naked photos. And it was the very young age group that was exposed the most, 16 to 25. Of course, the website doesn't allow people to be uh, posted to who are below 18. But s I found some uh, posts that uh, claim that they are the uh, victim is of uh, 16 years old. So I, I also put that in the in, when I was doing the different age grouping. And you can see women are more visible. And that if you compare with a post that is uh, featuring a m man, then the ratio is quite higher, you know. And photos overall, uh, um, half of the total photos, you know, they were shot by the victims, which is, you know, se se sex or uh, sex tapes in the beginning. And they contain more nudity. And the narratives in the revenge porn posts actually blamed and uh, labeled the person as hypersexual being or you know negative character. 
and the audience comments express mi mixed reactions, but the dominant are you know seeking pleasure or desire, and uh, uh, making derogative comment on the person who is being exposed. Sometimes they also disapprove the post or the poster. Maybe they consider that the revenge is not justified or it didn't uh, meet up their standard of pornographic quality. And then I also collected another 20 uh, posts. And uh, I was focusing on the gen um, representation of the body and the performative acts in those videos and photos. And it was seen that uh, gender and heterosexual uh, codes were clearly marked in bodily representation and performative acts. Uh, the camera frame, uh, most of the time that uh, uh, they scrutinized the female body, the erogenous zones, whereas uh, the male bodies were, you know, were only seen when it came in contact with the female body. And the, uh, when I was analyzing these uh, qualitatively, I took help from uh, Neil's uh, paper on uh, porn videos. And there's also a marked uh, aspect of in performative acts, like uh, active male versus a passive female. I found uh, the, uh, there were some signs of you know, aggression, even though these are not mainstream pornographic films. These are uh, supposed to be uh, even in, in the representation, but still I, I, in many videos there were you know, spanking and uh, you know, hair pulling, that kind of aggression by the male participant on the female person. So, uh, females were always in the receiving end of uh, aggression you know, and submission. I wonder what would happen if the picture was other way around. And then uh, I also looked for intertextuality. Uh, different elements in the post uh, made meaning together. And actually the images were used as evidences against the revenge porn victims. Um, but. Uh, there are some uh, gestures and performative acts which are signifiers. And the, f the story and the words in the title uh, depended on, on those signifiers. I will show you some examples here. I'm not going to uh, de in detail, but uh, we can s uh, see that the women posted here in the videos and photos, they, these particular gestures are, you know, they participate in uh, acts that may not be uh, meeting our standard of hygiene or, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So the story projected her as an unhygienic person and also a uh, hypersexual woman. And then the words in the title that she is a slut. And that is quite uh, discursive. I think mean, we have a history of you know, slut shaming. Uh, it's not uh, welcome that women are being uh, sexual and then they will face some kind of shaming. That's quite discursive construction. So I think uh, in the discussion part, we can say you know there is a re relation between different uh, elements in the in the uh, post that they make meaning together. At the same time, there is also a relationship uh, of uh, uh, audience comments, which is based on the content. So we can see embedded ideologies in the content. Um, it is also reflected through audience comments. So we can say like, it's a preferred uh, meaning that is reflected uh, by the audience's preferred reading. And uh, why it is affecting women more? Because it is uh, the use and treatment of women in both private and public spaces uh, you know, based on notions like shame, honor, chastity. Not maybe in uh, developed Western societies, but in many societies. So this can affect more women. And a website like myx.com, I think it's being institutionalized because they have their own uh, legal policies and they, uh, they instruct and they regulate and you know uh, govern the person who are posting it. So it's kind of institutionalizing this kind of content, and without a, a proper regulatory policy, sometimes uh, it becomes institutional in the society. 
So that, that was it. Thank you for listening. I will just uh, uh, say that please excuse me uh, for the language, you know, I, I'm not so fluent in English. And also for yesterday, I did the, the upper uh, from behind the camera and uh, Stuart was presenting and, and I really did a messy job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to be really annoying for a second. I am the lady with two laptops because uh, Keynote hates PowerPoint and PowerPoint hates Keynote. <laughs> um, so let's see how this works. Okay. Hello, I'm from England. Um, <laughs> just, 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 just to get that even and done with. <laughs> Um, so with this talk, um, I'd like to explore the, a lot of the work that I'm doing around meme as well technology, which I'll explain a little bit further, uh, in the context of services and apps online, and what this means for the future of tech that attempts to improve lives for others, but actually falls foul of the institutional society and industry biases that also them. Now this begins with condoms. Everyone likes talking about condoms. Um, so you've got these two 15-year-old guys who are brilliant. Uh, bless them, who uh, win this science prize for the colour-changing condom, which, as you can probably guess, changes colour when it su suggests the presence of STDs. Now, the problem is here, no one thought that there would be a conversation before or after your junk turns blue because you have chlamydia. <laughs> because this is kind of like living in a society where um, it shows you the problem but not how to deal with it. Now, means well technology exists in isolation of how we normalize and understand apps and services online and, or in general and never quite understands that users often use them differently than originally intended. Because we're humans that rub up against, no pun intended, the uh, technology in very anticipated ways because shame is a really big part of this stuff. And stigma in particular and our understanding of sort of shame and normalcy in general is really at the crux of a lot of this means well technology. As Georgina Voss, who is here somewhere in this building, uh, said in her talk on sensitive media, uh, shame and stigma are socially constructed and vary massively by space to space or from bedroom from bedroom, uh, with the definitions defined culturally, not by the technology as an isolated thing. Now, that difference between an object as designed and an object in the world is a bit like oxidization, and with the systems that come into contact with it, a bit like rust, really. This is a really fun thing I'm choosing to do. Now, means well technology doesn't rigorously consider the social and cultural frictions at play when these technologies enter the world, or how the real world outside the vacuum of innovation and the acknowledgement that its experiences are actually really, really narrow, actually operate. So everything is beautiful and nothing hurts. Well done, you. That's great. Awesome. So I'm going to look at a couple of examples of means well technology. So things like the Samaritan's Radar, which was appeared in the UK. Now, this app was created with really good intentions um, because it alerted you, supposedly, to the signs of depression in your friend's social media feeds. However, one, consent issues. No, like You don't know if your friend is tracking you on Twitter for signs of depression. And if your friends are told you're depressed, then so will those that can take full and will take advantage of it. Now, as Zoe Stavry said in her blog post about this, um, the Samaritans have unwittingly automated the process, giving a handy notification to trolls when one of their victims is down. Now, this and technologies like it show you uh, the wildly unqualified and well-meaning other, which might be your friend, um, a problem but not how to deal with it or prepare you for it when it's used against you. Because those who need to see a therapist might not do so after your friend has used an app because he's essentially been digitally, your digital behavior has outed you or caused shame in some ways. Um, which kind of guides me on to these wonderful group of technologies called Shady Neighbourhood Apps, if you've ever seen these. Uh, now, this particular one called Ghetto Tracker, this is a legitimate term for an app uh, in 2013, uh, which shows you which parts of town are safe, which ones are ghetto or unsafe. Now, I can't tell you, obviously, what the problem is with the word ghetto being used. <laughs> now, they, they changed it in 2014. Oh, they didn't do the strike through. Damn it, PowerPoint. Um, so that, the top line is not what it's called anymore and they change it to good part of town which isn't that much better um, and when, uh, when the Huffington Post uh, wrote to these app makers and said hey what's the deal this is rubbish uh, the app team said I can't be held responsible for the assumptions people may make in regards to factors like race and income also known as not my fucking problem uh, now per Davis Hardshaw uh, in his article about these kind of uh, roots of um, groups of apps 
So rather than bridging gaps between neighbours, uh, these things like next door is another one as well, which is really weird, uh, can become a forum for paranoid racialism. And there's another one called Sketch Factor. Look at these smiley white people. <laughs> Aren't they great? <laughs> so they're a Manhattan-based navigation app uh, that crowdsource user experiences along with publicly available data to rate the relative sketchiness of a certain areas of major cities. Now, the, the reason why I brought this example up is because the founders were fully aware in lots of interviews that racial profiling exists. However, they said that racial profiling is sketchy itself and were confident that their app would not have an issue and people that are essentially altruistic and really nice. Um, Andrew Marantz in The New Yorker traced how the app eventually did become more toxic and how people historically, and even now, are known to mask the occasional racist hue with words like dangerous or sketchy and use certain identifiers like, oh, women with dreads and that kind of thing, which is ridiculous. So I'm going to come to people. Who knows what people is? <laughs> oh, it's the best app on the internet. <laughs> so it's like the, the Yelp for people, essentially. And it caused a massive controversy in 2015 um, because it stemmed from Silicon Valley's absolute obsession with the reputation economy, um, which was supposed to help people make informed decisions about the people in their life professionally, personally, and romantically. So you could rate people and give recommendations on how good of a date they were, for instance, which is never going to be used when a butthurt guy who doesn't get to sleep with you because you bought, he bought you dinner. So therefore, it's going to leave you a really frosty review saying, she was really cold. Don't date her. Now, this opened up individuals to abuse because in the original iteration, you had um, if someone put a negative comment about you, you, were, you couldn't go to moderate and say, this, is, this really sucks. You had to talk to the person that put that there. So you had two days grace period where you'd be like, hey, can you take this horrible offensive comment down? And clearly that's making those who are subject to abuse talk to their abusers, which as everyone knows is not a good idea. Um, and that then it just was undeletable for a whole year. So it was just there. And uh, this is living in a world where everyone is really nice to each other again, um, as with the shady sort of like neighborhood apps. It's like the Truman Show. Now it died, apparently, until this year. When they went to Silicon, actually went to Silicon Valley and spoke to Y Combinator, who are one of the biggest incubators for new technologies in, in San Francisco, uh, and they kind of they changed a few things. They said they took on board the comments, but yet um, the negative comments could be hidden, which I guess is fine. But people can still put negative comments about you online. So, but for, in order for you to take them off, you have to join their service. When you join their service, you agree to their terms and conditions, so which, which means that you can't really block and report people without joining up. Now, the terms and conditions say, once content is published, it may not be able to be removed, and by joining, you hereby irrevocably grant to people the continuous, non-exclusive, royalty-free use to your content for any purpose whatsoever in any format, which is kind of mental. <laughs> um, so, and also, they, they have this one thing called the truth license, so the service is free to use as well, unless you pay, like I think it's like $10 a month or something, and then you have access to anyone's profile and all the negative reviews if you pay for it, because it's the, the truth, right? And as we all know, you don't have to have money to get the truth, do you? No, of course not. So, ah. Barbara Streisand. Sorry, <laughs> I'm in New York. Um, because we don't exist um, in a vacuum with the technology that we create. As in the case of Google Glass, other people's technology happens to us. Uh, we are subject to someone else's solution, and when you insert a solution into the world, it's bumping up against thousands of other people's bullshit solutions as well, which causes us problems that we're only really starting to understand. Uh, now, Evan Selinger and Brett Frischman um, mentioned in an article about smart technologies, um, so about stepping away from the programmable world in some ways, where we're made predictable by models of data collection enacted upon us, from social media to the Internet of Things to reputation apps for the purpose of ease, betterment, or richer understandings of technology. Now, if this means well technology becomes a standard element of this, which arguably already is kind of becoming, then it's catch-all applications of kindness and helpfulness and safety, which doesn't acknowledge the instability and variety of context and behaviours, then we're essentially designing for a world where the fire is always put out every single time, which is distracting and not right, and very, very privileged. Just save your problems. Because this, this is what, this is what, unfortunately, some of the things is. There's a great paper about um, the idea of when you're in a certain position of privilege, then you absolutely have like to, to know the answer, and you have to solve their world problems, and like uh, that kind of thing. Um, but it's difficult to know every circumstance in which your newly developed technology can be abused. I'm not expecting everyone to kind of run through everything and say, this is definitely going to happen. 
um, or broken with these clashes, but acknowledging that your innovation will be inserted into a system rather than a disruptor or saviour of it might just help navigate away from this sort of homogenous and programmable future that we're mistaking as being the preferable one. Mm. I'm not arguing that we should stop being altruistic, but rather address who we're being altruistic for and how. Now, oh, what have I done there? Now, as Deb Chakra, who unfortunately isn't here, cause she, but she's awesome, uh, once told me, any sufficiently advanced neglect is indistinguishable from malice, which is an appropriation of the third law of Clark. Um, because if you ignore it enough and you don't address it and you keep forgetting it and losing it out, and like an app update is not enough for you to have to deal with someone's like problem, then it, you might as well just be abusing them in the first place anyway. Now, Silicon Valley has this very perpetually reinforced progress dogma that basically just put things out to market and just see what happens, and then we'll fix it if it happens, uh, kind of unaware of the real world that they're setting out into. So, uncertainty. Yay. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Gillian. Um, that <laughs> means well is the uh, attempted minimization of uncertainty and anxiety, applying certain rules that ignore the ways in which the world actually operates and who will be in it and who will have to live with it and be harmed by it. It ignores the power structures that exist because it's in the future they're kind of attempting to force. These structures will be solved by these narrow and arguably dangerous solutions. An app update, as I said before, is not enough. I love repeating myself, it's great. Um, <laughs> so I'm kind of looking a lot at intersectionality through futures design. I work a lot in the future, uh, which is a wildly uh, uneven place. Um, and looking at the how you can bring futures out of like the boardroom BP shell. Hey, oil's going to run out soon. Um, futures world to more like who might live in these future, what the possible breakages that might occur, what kind of things might be there. Because things do shift across kind of context and subvert these contexts and all of that kind of thing. Because futures is the act of acknowledging uncertainty as it increases over time. And it's also the act of the acknowledgement that the depth of what we're uncertain about becomes wildly <coughs> unfamiliar as, as it, these horizons race against us. Now, innovation doesn't like uncertainty. Everyone likes solving problems. I mean, it's good to solve problems. I'm not saying that we should just be like, oh, fuck it, chaos and entropy. Um, but, but it's important to use it. uncertainty as a really valuable resource. And intersectionality and asking different questions and talking to different people and moving things across context because the worst thing that has ever <laughs> existed is the idea of like the four-person user persona kind of profile where you have four people that you're designing for and they're very easy to solve their problems because they don't exist, they're not real people. It's very easy for you to abuse people that aren't real. So this uncertainty and the acknowledgement of it is a way of you kind of anticipating how not to fuck up people's lives as much. Innovation people, sorry. I know it's like you off all the time. Um, but yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll leave you with this, this, this lady. She's cool. <laughs> I'm the person who has to take Gillian Anderson away from you. I don't really. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, she'll come back. It's true. It's not right. uh, okay. I'm going to read um, because following yesterday I am not chill. And because when I speak on this topic um, without a script, I swear a lot more. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> So whenever I um, start a paper on Gamergate, I'm faced first with the challenge of how one content or trigger warns for a paper about Gamergate. I'm tempted to really just start insisting that Gamergate is its own trigger and just kind of like leave it there. Um, but some of you have never heard of these folks before and that's great. I'm sorry. Um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, sometimes displaying um, material and, and reading from people who use video games as a very thin excuse to harass people for being women, for being feminists, uh, for being queer, for being racialized, basically for being marginalized in any way and wanting to see those experiences reflected in the games that they play. If you face or have faced these violences as part of your daily reality, or if they're triggering to you for other reasons because you're caring for someone in a similar position or what have you, you're welcome to leave at any point uh, or to do anything you need to do short of screaming at me um, to take care of yourself in that moment. And indeed, I really encourage you to do so. Hearing and seeing this stuff is not work that I or anyone else should actually demand or force on you. Because here's the thing, Gamergate is boring. <laughs> I don't say this to be edgy. I don't say this to belittle the experiences of people who have been targeted, just the opposite. When I say Gamergate is boring, what I mean is that as a movement, and even that language is super questionable, but uh, it's tactics, harassment, threats of violence, its aims, the continued surviving and thriving of misogyny, heterosexism, racism, and their representation in video games, 
They are neither new nor in any way interesting or subversive. Most of us, particularly those of us who live and work uh, with these things daily, we're pretty sick of talking about them by now. Boring as it might be though, Gamergate requires attention. It's already received plenty, of course. Um, it's been the subject of countless think pieces, some of which have of course been more thoughtful than others, interviews and academic discussions. With varying degrees of complexity and nuance, many have centered around variations um, of the same question, articulated best by Zoe Quinn, one of the movement's earliest targets. Quote, this can't all be about just petty slut shaming and vague accusations of conflicts of interest that were immediately debunked, can it? Unquote. It can, and as far as myself and this paper are concerned, it is. And the time for that question and the disbelief about the persistence and impact of systemic violence it represents is over. My interest then is not in tracing over the accounts um, that are probably familiar to some of you about the hows and whys and whens of Gamer the Gate, although I can certainly speak to that in the question period if you'd like. Um, but instead in considering how such archives, particularly those produced by its target, both capture and produce formations of labor. In other words, this paper asks how we might think about enduring and documenting Gamergate as a specific form of work, and how particular struggles against it can similarly be understood as reactions to and against the exhausting labors that it demands. I'm also focusing on specific instances of work referred to as effective labor, so those forms of work organized around attempting either to produce or disrupt specific feelings and attachments in the self or in others, um, or put more simply, um, that. Um, so a third and more specific question that therefore kind of guides my research is to what work feelings are being put in both surviving and producing accounts of Gamergate. Um, so I'll be giving a brief overview of three particular archives compiled by three of the more visible targets of Gamergate, game designers um, Zoe Quinn and Brianna Wu, and critic Anita Sarkeesian. Even within this narrow search, there are still a lot of options to choose from, because as my introduction rather bitterly noted, one of the ways in which the violences of Gamergate get reproduced is through this constant demand for proof that they are in fact violences at all. Yeah. So I won't have time today to consider all of these examples in depth, but the archives that I've chosen should provide you with a kind of representative sample. So it begins apt, or it seems apt to begin with Zoe Quinn, the self-professed most hated person on the internet. In an article detailing what it is to embody this position, Quinn offers extensive, effective, and often affecting evidence of her experiences in both the form of screenshots and kind of personal anecdotes. So in the early hours after her ex-partner had published some of his accusations, she recalls watching her online presence shift before her eyes. Some of the earliest instances were, in, were edits to her Wikipedia page, like this one, that had, quote, altered her date of death to coincide with planned public appearances, or in one case, simply soon. Quote. She watched as 4chan users began to share resources and information about her past, any kind of humiliating data that they thought they could find and use against her and describes waking up in the middle of the night, quote, shocked awake from half-asleep nightmares about everyone she loved, buying into the mob's bullshit and abandoning her, unquote. While the latter was thankfully not realized, this didn't stop Gamer Gators from pushing those connected to Quinn as far as she could. She, uh, her father, she writes, who barely knows how to operate his cell phone or type properly, has learned from experience, quote, to hang up when someone calls and screams, your daughter is a whore, unquote. All of this is work, and it takes place on multiple levels. It is the work of having undergone this in the first place, but it is also the labor of mobilizing the affects involved, the fear and the anxiety and the humiliation, into something teachable. For that's what this particular archive really is. It teaches, it instructs, and while it deploys specific and sometimes really devastating examples, um, part of its point is its generalizability, the applicability and replicability of Quinn's experiences to whomever the next target of online harassment might be. So while Quinn's account offers a little bit of reflective distance, a kind of panoramic overview of Gamergate, others take a more immediate and visceral vantage point. Um, so Anita Sarkeesian's Tumblr post, One Week of Harassment on Twitter, is exactly the kind of archive it says on the label, right? It's a collection of hundreds of tweets sent to her over the course of one week filled with misogyny, racism, incitement to suicide, and threats of nearly every kind of physical, emotional, and sexual violence imaginable. Even when one is prepared for what's coming as a reader, it's almost impossible, it's almost unbearable to get to the end. It's exhausting and unvarying. The words cunt and whore and die and slut and rape and bitch 
appearing so many times that these messages start to feel like they're bleeding into one giant missive, even at the same time as one is constantly reminded that they are in fact separate. This exhaustion and sadness and rage um, incited by the archive is important because it makes the work of reading the post mirror as closely as possible Sarkeesian's own labor of receiving and enduring these messages. Sarkeesian both represents but also requires effective labor of viewers here. This is still a pedagogy, let's be clear, but unlike Quinn's, it's one produced through the infliction of active and extensive discomfort. Brianna Wu's Twitter um, functions similarly, capturing not only her experiences with Gamergate, but her struggles against larger systemic organizations and institutions like Twitter and law enforcement. Wu has, she wrote in one post, a pile of SIM cards for when she gets doxxed, an event that has occurred with enough frequency that she doesn't know her phone number anymore. In another message, she asked followers to imagine walking down the street and every third stranger yelling at you, arguing that this is analogous to what it is to be a feminist public figure. Such conversations have become so repetitive for Wu that at one point she jokingly posted a poll which asked whether or not she should write a Twitter bot that'll have conversations with sexist dudes so that she and other feminists don't have to. Um, she's also repeatedly posted screenshots like this one of her email inbox when it's composed of nothing but a wall of responses from Twitter uh, support regarding her reports of harassment and threats on the platform. So like Sarkeesian, Wu's representation of what it is to live as a target of Gamergate emphasizes its constant, exhausting repetition and devastating effects. The ways in which fearing for one's personal safety can become a quotidian, monotonous reality rather than a state of exception. Like I said before, Gamergate is boring. These are only some of the many kinds of work associated with what Michael Mandyberg has called the overarching, effective labor of Gamergate, the labor of being afraid. But where does conceptualizing Gamergate as a struggle over and about labor take us in terms of solutions for survival and resistance? The archives I've reviewed are, of course, a response to and form of labor in themselves, and I noted how each demands distinct forms of work from their viewers as well. But I want to turn now in the last part of my paper to an alternative strategy, which I'm referring to as the monetization of Gamergate's effective labors. So Casey Tron is a famous Twitch personality. Um, she's been described in a lot of ways, Colbert-esque, Troller of Trolls, or as Megan Condes describes her character, quote, an amalgamation of annoying characteristics satirizing gendered stereotypes that abound in gaming culture, unquote. Casey Tron is essentially a kind of satirical performance of the fake geek girl trope, constantly hypersexualized and seemingly uncritical and unself-aware. One recurring and personal favorite of mine um, kind of move in her performances um, involves purposely playing, playing really poorly during her streams while congratulating herself extravagantly or blaming other people for her failures. So given that her work uh, revolves around mocking the very misogyny and heterosexism that underpins movements like Gamergate, it's probably unsurprising that Casey Tron faces a constant barrage of attacks much like the ones you've already seen. What she's done with them though is somewhat unique. In the wake of Gamergate, as the frequency and severity of these things increased, uh, Casey Tron promised to read even the most vitriolic messages she received out loud on her stream with the important requirement that those messages were accompanied by a financial contribution to her site. She is, in short, monetizing the work of acknowledging Gamergate and hatred like it by requiring payment for doing so. This matters, I want to suggest, not only as another kind of clever instance of her trolling the trolls, which is how it's quite often read. Um, for me, the significance of this move to monetize is not even about Gamergate itself, or at least not only about that. It's about the ways in which demanding payment for this type of taxing, ridiculous, and deeply dispiriting labor draws attention to it as work, rather than as a natural or dehistoricized condition inherent to being a feminized, feminist, or racialized person on the internet. This denaturalization of affective labor also mirrors similar historical projects in ways that can allow working against Gamergate to forge critical connections with progressive movements um, and projects. So materialist feminists famously demanded wages for housework, the group called, argued that calling housework and rep reproduction labors of love constituted, quote, the most pervasive manipulation, the most subtle and mystified violence, unquote, that capital had ever inflicted. For calling it this allowed the work to be conceptualized not as labor, but as a somehow natural condition of women's character or physiology. So by demanding compensation then, they argued that they were undermining capital itself, which relies for its survival on the absence of this kind of work from the paid labor force. So wages for housework has been critiqued for a number of reasons and on a number of grounds, and my aim in calling our attention to it now is not to elide these concerns. 
indeed perhaps the most pervasive criticism of the program, that its efforts to organize around and against domestic and reproductive work ultimately recenter those domains as the apex of women's political and social existences, is extremely relevant in Casey Tran's case. After all, it's one thing to insist that dealing with hate groups like Gamergate is work deserving of compensation. It's another to imagine basing a political movement around such stunningly abject conditions of possibility. The truth is that no payment could ever be enough. The truth is that the only prospect worse than wages for Gamergate is dealing with its bullshit for free. The truth is that all our responses, archiving, reflecting, ranting, monetizing, they are none of them enough, and they are all of them central. I have one sentence, sorry. The truth is that the work of imagining beyond violences like Gamergate requires surviving violences like Gamergate, and that the work of doing so is sometimes as unbearable as not doing it. The truth is, as the Lies Collective puts it, that everything we write and a lot type, code, play, and feel will be used against us. Thank you. I'm gonna sit up here for the <coughs> maybe I want. Um, so uh, we have half an hour now for questions. Um, and I was actually thinking, I don't want to put you guys on the spot, but if any of you guys have like questions for each other that really struck you, you guys are probably the most expert people on this, these topics here. Does anybody have anything on the panel they want to say? Okay. <laughs> I might know a little bit. My brain's still like soaking in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let me know. Let me know. Um, so one question that I had to start things off is, uh, we had a few different things about Gamergate here, and I'm kind of curious like why so much uh, attention has been paid to Gamergate compared to other forms of online harassment. Like, is there something specific about Gamergate that uh, really challenges people? Other, is it just the volume of attacks, or is there something like special about Gamergate itself and its content that is especially important? Is there something special about Gamergate? They really think so, um, but no. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think part of it, for me at least, was just the um, transparency of its hatred, um, right? That there's a way in which um, the types of hate that are kind of at work in Gamergate are so easy to see and so transparent can, compared to a lot of other similar, <laughs> excuse me, similar projects. Um, and despite that transparency, there's this persistence of disbelief, right? That, that question from Quinn that I started with. People constantly thinking like, this can't be it, there has to be more. And I was really interested um, in that kind of denial and that kind of persistent disbelief in the face of overwhelming evidence that yes, this is just, this is just sexism, this is just racism. wildly unqualified to talk about this probably, um, but there's a, there's a great um, conversation I've had with a couple of people about Gamergate in terms of how it relates to things like British politics. Mm -hmm. So in the, uh, in the UK there's a kind of ongoing joke that the, the right will unite over anything unanimously, collectively and just go, <laughs> go at it, while the left will, decide, will be squabbling about what that thing is. And the things with Gamergate, it literally is a case of like mass mobilization over one thing that they think is the right thing, but isn't, and then it just basically becomes blurred to a point where it's just as Mega says, just mundanity. Mm -hmm. And I think they like, yeah, so they like the idea of it being this kind of, I don't know, cultural thing that people might study, but in a good way, but. Yeah, I sort of, I've, I've thought about this and I keep going back and forth. Um, I, I do think that uh, the, the movement is, is more organized than a lot of sort of previous, previous ones. I think it's larger, um, more like as an organizational scholar also, it's, it's efficient. Um, and I think that's an important you know, thing that they sort of noted. I also think that there is a kind of Trump effect that happens where even in critiquing it, it raises the profile. And so it becomes a cultural touchstone for people um, on, sort of all, on sort of both sides. And I think that's something to also be wary of. It's why I tr try to not sort of explicitly mention the movement my name too much. I don't use the hashtag uh, in those particular ways. I think that that is actually sort of what gives it more traction um, and power and cultural legitimacy. <laughs> Okay, um, I have one other question and then I'll open it up to you guys. Uh, I thought, so I noticed that uh, there were a lot of like heads nodding when uh, intertextuality was mentioned. 
And I guess I just want to throw out an open-ended question, like if you guys could talk more about how intertextuality or the idea of aggression or hacking relates to like why we should see it as a discourse, what's what's the advantage of that for us as critics or intellectuals to look at it that way. Um, I'm just really curious, especially because so much of hacking and aggression seems about the intrusion of one discourse into the other. It's an intrusive act. So maybe you guys can talk more about that if anyone has ideas. I think what I'm really interested in is a kind of algorithmic intertextuality and a kind of algorithmic literacy that I sort of am I'm seeing pop up in a lot of these these spaces. I think that um, yeah, Silicon Valley has told us we're, we're, we're prosumers for a long time that we're like we are we we own our content and we are the gate, you know the gatekeepers now. But I don't really think that's that promise has been fulfilled, and because I think there's a lot of sort of algorithmic uh, infrastructure that moderates it behind the scenes. And what I think is really uh, in so. <coughs> Even in sort of a lot of the like the conflicts between blockbot groups that I'm seeing, or even between you know gamer gators and blockbot, gamer gators are very anti-blockbots um, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, even in those in, in those vitriolic debates that can get really bad, um, you're still seeing people talk about the role of algorithms and text together, thinking about well, what does it mean to filter on a hashtag versus filter on a social network graph versus filter on natural language processing versus having a, you know a, re requiring two people to approve something before it gets on a block list versus one. Um, I'm seeing, I think, far more like people thinking sincerely and, and you know, yeah, sincerely about the role that algorithms play in relation to text. Uh, and I think, and that's sort of what's powering the, the social web. So, uh, for website uh, called myx.com, I, I don't think it's the only discourse. You know, audience. Uh, there were some audience who interpreted it in a different way. So there is alternative uh, discourses. But the dominant discourse is there, you know, the, and that's how the intertextuality works. Uh, the, the ideology is about misogyny, or you know, that depends on the intersexuality. Uh, whoever is breaking the codes, uh, that is highlighted all the time in the stories, and the images are, you know, kind of uh, supports that uh, story. Uh, but of course, there is alternative discourses. You know, some many uh, were protesting that, and they were reminding the laws. But in U.S., in not all the states have the laws. So sometimes, in people in some states, they will not um, pay heed to that. You know. Well, I guess it's to do with the sort of shady neighborhood apps <coughs> and the way that people talk about difference. Um, in particular, people people don't want like people don't think they're racist and they think they're being outwardly racist. But they'll write things that indicate towards like certain anxieties that white people have around. Um, about people of colour, so for instance, like dangerous or sketchy, and there's a, there's a report that I actually took out of the presentation because I was going to go over time. I think where someone says, "Oh, a woman with dreads was speaking very aggressively, asking for this," and it's very sort of like a lot of things which are kind of coded into what people, or what white people think, is very sort of um, behaved by people of colour, and and things like even like with people, especially like the way that you talk about people. So it's very impolite, and you would seem seen as a bad person if you were a guy who said on this particular um, profile, uh, yeah, she didn't sleep with me because I bought her dinner, but you can say things like she was frosty, she was cold, she was really unwelcoming and that kind of thing, which I think is a larger system sort of like about language and abuse. And I mean, I'd be really interested to, to run, I'm sure someone has done it, a kind of semantic text analysis about what's not talked about and what's, what the gaps and, and the absences are. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have anything interesting to say on this question, um, which is a really good question, but just I think for me, What's been striking in the accounts that I've been looking at so far and the archives that I've been looking at so far has been the emphasis on Twitter, right? That Twitter has been um, the kind of central mobilizing force of Gamergate and the space in which um, the, the kind of weakness of the harassment policy there is um, what's, been, what's been critiqued and what's been emphasized. So intertextuality in terms of Twitter's algorithm rhythms is still a really important question, but I think I'm also interested as I sort of move forward with actually finishing writing this chapter, um, is in thinking then about um, about the ways that intertextuality is functioning, the importance of Tumblr as a space of archiving in particular, right? Um, Sarkeesian's mm -hmm. post is, is not on Twitter, it's on Tumblr. Um, and I think there's a very particular reason for that and a very particular way in which um, Tumblr handles this in a way that's quite different. Okay, so um, yeah, let's throw it open to the audience. <laughs>
come on up. Uh, maybe just like talk somewhere okay. around here. <laughs> This is a question for Mr. Namil about um, revenge porn. I wanted to hear your take on how, you know, the audience of revenge porn, um, we become complicit and we re-victimize the people. And I'm thinking about Aaron Andrews in particular where, like, I had to work so hard not to click. Like, I did not watch it. And it was so hard for me, even as a female, not to do that. So I would love to hear what you think about that. Uh, sorry. I, uh I just missed the main uh, point of the question. Uh, what, like, what do you feel about the re-victimization? Like, when, when audiences watch the revenge porn, like, he becomes complicit with the person seeking revenge. Or do you? I don't know. I, uh, re I don't know how you can uh, call it re-victimizing. Um, this audience will, uh, in any ways, they, they they will uh, look for porn uh, content. And this is just another genre. But uh, audience, which audience you talk about? Um, some people, there are uh, supporters of the victim. They are also watching it, and they, they comment on that. So uh, sometimes it's not only re-victimizing. Many people are porn consumers. Maybe then you can say re-victimizing. But some people, they repeatedly reminding uh, the laws in those states. So that's not re-victimizing, but that's Maybe you can also take it as a uh, advocacy because they are reminding the uh, other people, other watchers, the law about the laws and policies. You know. More questions? Yeah. Can I project from here? Um, well, I let's see if maybe we can get the. Mm, okay. Sorry, I want to make sure that the people live stream. We have another yeah. mic. Oh, we do? So this is also for MD Nabil. I noticed in one of the slides on your second point, you said that sites like MyX have a lack of proper regulatory policy. And I'm wondering, for a site that posts non-consensual sexual content, what a proper regulatory policy might be. Thank you for coming up here. That is a very good question. And I think there is a lot of debate about it. Uh, in some. So I can give you examples. There are some studies uh, on you know different legal frameworks in countries. For example, in Asia, uh, in my, uh, where I come from, uh, there there is the law that you can't even produce anything. You know, both sexting is illegal and revenge porn is of course the, the illegal thing. Um, for teenagers in U.S. or uh, in uh, of course maybe in uh, uh, Europe, teenagers cannot produce sexts. If, because that's child pornography. And there's also debate, you know, whether we should uh, refrain teenagers from sexting, because that is also a kind of denial of their agency. Uh, so what should be a good law? Uh, it's very difficult to say. It depends on the majority, uh, what they want. I, I, I can't really say what should be the best law. It depends on different contexts. So as a follow-up, not so much to do with the law and prohibiting the people from making the content in the first place. So say, for example, you're with a partner and there's been a video taken that's consensual and it isn't so much what the regulatory policy should be surrounding that content, but particularly the governance of the site that's then hosting that content when it becomes revenge porn. So less of a legal framework. Thank you for answering that question, though. But I'm wondering specifically about sites like my ex, which is what I understood you to be talking about, regulatory policies that might govern content on those sites. And if there can be a proper regulatory policy for that kind of content? Uh, I think, um, like I took some, some courses in criminology, and there's a very you know, common uh, thought that uh, you don't have to be a pervert or a big criminal to do these kind of things. It's just a routine activity. If you have the opportunity, uh, internet gives you anonymity. You, you are not identified. Uh, and then they do it, you know. So it's. Uh, I think people will take, um, you know, precautions. Everyone does it. You know, when you are in the street, you you have your own ideas. You know how to be safe, right? But some people don't, and uh, like some people even pay to be victimized. You know, there there are some categories like femdom, findom. They share all their informations as clients. They pay to the uh, cam girl or you know whoever it is uh, pro providing the service. So wh what would you call that? That's uh, that's a very different uh, and difficult question. <laughs> so, 
just a kind of a quick comment. I mean, the, the problem is with things like revenge porn sites is often that the technology is used to fix a problem or a change in the technology, when essentially what it's pointing to is about behavior because it's never about the technology. We shouldn't, in an ideal world, have to deal with the fact that there are women's pictures being put up unconsent, like on, without consent online. There's a kind of drastic educational sort of issue here. So maybe it's not a technological policy in some ways, but more of an educational one in terms of like informing consent early. I mean, I know that lots of countries do talk about it. And the idea of trust, um, I mean, there's a great quote by Natalie, who I think is here. Um, I'm going to get it horribly wrong, but she said that trust is the uh, future congenital... Oh, it's getting it wrong. Basically, paraphrasing, that um, trust is you sort of essentially anticipating what other people might do to you in the future. Um, so trust dynamics and, and things that happen between people is, is the core of this, in my, in my kind of reading of this in some ways, is that we shouldn't have to deal with this, but while we do, there are things that, that again, that we can protect ourselves from in terms of, uh, perhaps you can comment on in game again, how women talk with each other, about what you do like. I mean, I, again, honestly, I, when I had a conversation about this panel and someone used the Gamergate hashtag to, um, to describe it, um, which was great, um, the, um, I immediately went to a friend who is fantastic at these kind of situations um, and just said, okay, so if anything happens, what do I do? And she went, don't worry, I'll take you through it. And that's, um, there is, as you said before, this effective labor of women having to support each other in times of crisis like this. And the same with revenge porn. Like, I've had numerous conversations with people where it's not even a case that women shouldn't have to like, reduce their sexuality and say, like, because sex is going to happen regardless of whether it's, it's banned or not, or whether it's illegal. Like, that's, like, that's just going to happen. Um, so it's, it's more sort of having, like the condom question, for instance, like having a conversation with, with your partner about STDs, about sex, about openness, all that kind of stuff, might do something to mitigate the problem. Absolutely. And yeah, those communities definitely do exist. And I mean, I've kind of felt the effect of them personally starting out research on this. The day I said I was working on this chapter next was the day one of my supervisors sat me down and was like, okay, so here's what needs to happen. Here's what needs to happen with your passwords. Here's what needs to happen with what browser you're using. And went through this whole list, which was exhausting and infuriating and it was awful, but it needed to happen, right? So those communities are, I think, absolutely essential to making it through this process. Um, if you're a target in any kind of capacity. Um, I mean, I think too, Brianna Wu does a really interesting job in the way that she uses Twitter of both, um, both representing that in the ways that I showed, but it's also just her regular Twitter. Like it's not her Gamergate special Twitter, right? Um, so there's a way in which you really see, you know, she'll be tweeting about a game or about, you know, anything else that you're really excited about. And then all of a sudden it's interrupted by stuff like this. And I think posing it and representing it as an interruption as something that's you know interrupting the work that you want to be doing, the talks that you want to be giving is is also a really powerful way to both you know support and participate in that community and also to um, speak to the desire to refuse to refuse that work, right? Sorry, I just missed out that time. Uh, I think it, can you really intervene uh, all the time you know, with the legal frameworks and everything? It's, it's too, it would be too much of interventionism. But I have found uh, in the in the when I was doing the study, like some people they they don't take their uh, full uh, body picture, you know, they cut their uh, head or you know, put up a mask. That's very funny, but it's practical, you know. And then the audience do not really um, accept that post as a you know re truly revenge porn and according to their standard, and they kind of disapprove the poster that he couldn't collect the you know full body picture, so it's not a revenge porn post. But this is funny, but it may be practical. <laughs> we have time for another, probably two questions. Does okay? Yep. Uh, <clears throat> regarding the people app, Hi. Um, <laughs> so I think it's I think it's sort of jokingly or, or just as a, as a handy description called like Yelp for people. Mm -hmm. um, but that's interesting because I think. You know, it, it's not like Yelp is, you know, Yelp has its own problems. Um, the people who contribute to it create this lens into reality that everyone else who uses it, uh, you know, sees the content through. And it's a big, it, it's, a, it's a stark difference between the users and the kind of creators. Um, so I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on kind of how the creation of apps creates a lens or an opinion or, you know, for the benefit of, of whom, and if it's by design or just as an artifact. Try and try and answer this in the best way, um, but I guess a lot of it's to do with context collapse, right? 
this idea of when you, when you sort of, uh, there's, there's, there's often you get with these fantastic like articles, especially in the UK, like BuzzFeed, where you have like, restaurant owner argues with the internet about bad review of salad or something. And you and like the, the person who tries to argue and say, oh no, this, well this person had like, no, they were really rude. And like, their salad wasn't bad because the chef was ill. And, like, so, but all that stuff doesn't make it towards the comment section, right? And I guess in the same with like, the relationships you put on things with people, like, you're not gonna put the entire, every single thing about like, that, that person's relationship or the thing that you put on there. Because one, you don't see it a certain way when you're angry or when you're, when you're really happy and you don't see all the bad stuff or you don't see all the good stuff. Um, but in terms of like, apps that try and sort of like represent things and represent people, that's just the ultimate issue with like trying to represent anything. I guess it's a really like bad way of handling that off, but there's always going to be um, that sort of like a cultural layer over how the world is seen by other people. And then I guess that, I mean, talking about Yelp in particular, when you go to a new city and you kind of go through saying, hey, I want to find this restaurant. I'm not saying that people are like restaurants, by the way, um, but like... Um, that you kind of go through and go like, oh, this place looks really good to eat, and I kind of like, I kind of trust that because like, I, I, from my own cultural knowledge and my own sort of like, um, the language that I might use to, to, to talk about good stuff, that fits me. But to other people, that's going to be different. But the, the, the problem is the dangerous thing is when it talks about people and when it talks about things like, um, like again, the shadiness of, of neighbourhoods. All of these are meant to try and fix stuff and to try and uh, actually try and push a certain way of how the world should be seen in some ways. And a lot of them are very idealised. A lot of them are kind of people, um, like when you say good things about someone, like it's because you're, they're your friend, right? And I'm wildly rambling here, but um, but the, because you want them to be seen by other people, either it's how you see them or it's like how you potentially want other people to see it. Like everyone lies on their CV, for instance. So you, you have control over your own representation and your own image in that way. But if other people are doing that for you, then it just kind of creates this weird mass of uncertainty and uh, that, that is counterproductive. And I'm not sure if I answered your question properly, but like it's also something I'm kind of working out. So I'm just that's me thinking in public. Sorry. Okay, we have four minutes left, so go for it. Okay. Hello, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on what does effective bystander intervention look like in internet media communities, especially when so often it seems like a lot of harassers think that they are, you know, on the good side, quote. Sure. So, yeah. yeah, I can start with that. Um, what does it look like? I mean, I think in a lot of cases um, it's about recognizing work that's already being done, right? So the importance of kind of signal boosting the type of stuff that um, that these archives are representing is a huge part of it. Um, I mean, there's been critiques and, you know, interesting critiques of um, white knight syndrome in relation to Gamergate, right? Like um, men who kind of like ride in and with varying levels of fairness are critiqued for like trying to come in and save the vulnerable women. Um, like I said, there are varying levels of fairness to that depending on the, the particular case that we're talking about. But um, I think for me, effective allyship in relation to Gamergate is primarily primarily a matter of not starting with that question. This is going to sound really narcissistic, but um, not starting with that question that I said I wouldn't start with about like not taking that question of, you know, but could it be something else seriously? And just starting from a place that no, this is what it is. It is transparent misogyny, sexism, racism, and working from that point instead of requiring the constant reworking and rearticulation of that kind of explanatory labor. I, I completely agree with Megan because it's, it's a case of where if you're constantly having to say, it's this actually, it's like, and having to explain yourself, like you shouldn't have to fucking explain yourself if you're the one who is, who's being abused. Like, it, but you're right, it has to be, things like, again, the apps I mentioned before are all about institutional problems and, and power structures. Like it's, and, and being sort of an, an ally, if, if that's kind of what, what we're talking about, is, is, is empathy and knowing that it's happening. Like you mentioned beforehand, like, um, I've, I've had a conversation, uh, particularly, unfortunately, with men about how big of a deal Gamergate is or how big of a deal revenge porn is because often the people who are uh, the, the most vulnerable are the ones like, who experience the most and therefore if you're not vulnerable, you don't experience it. So if you're a white male from like, San Francisco, you're probably never going to be like, stopped in the street because you look a bit dodgy and you're never going to have like, your junk, which you're probably given to people by accident anyway. By Felipe is a really interesting app. I've actually just discovered it, which is where women basically show the, the kind of shit that, that men uh, send them. Um, because they're always the ones who are like, oh, it's okay, it's fine. My, my, my dick won't appear on a revenge porn site, but I guess it will in some ways. 
Um, but it's uh, it's it isn't essentially as you said before, just pointing at the problem and like having empathy with the with the abusers in some way. The abusees, sorry. Uh, some of the advocacy agencies, you know, they they spread out a lot of advices what to do and what not to do, and um, it's some most of the time it uh, addresses the middle class white women, you know, at the teenagers. Uh, wh what about the working class women? It's like taken for granted that they will uh, participate in, in those activities. And all the time they're reminding uh, the girls that they have to have, uh, you know, uh, uphold chastity, shame, honor. But that's not actually inclusive to the working class uh, or, you know, other, um, like, women of color. So that kind of advice also creates kind of, uh, you know, double standard interventionism. Yeah, and and I, I want to echo you know previous three things, but uh, but also uh, I think uh, sharing experiences is a very powerful thing. Knowing that you're not alone. Um, I'm in a situation now where I'm after because of doing this work, getting a lot of replies from eggs and in my mentions. Um, it's fun. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's great. Uh, but no, a lot of resources too. And that's one thing that a lot of these block bot communities provide is also the secondary benefit of, uh, of collective sense making and what the hell is going on, what steps to do. I also want to point out a, um, a partner, there's a study by, uh, some, uh, done by the uh, Women Action and the Media uh, Organization that had this sort of thing where they had an authorized reporter status with Twitter where people could submit uh, abusive tweets to them and then they would help shepherd it through Twitter's official abuse process, which is very opaque and difficult. And one of the things they found is that only 43% of reports came from people who were actually the targets. The majority of people uh, who were reporting tweets to WAM who were uh, as abusive or harassment were from bystanders or other, in other individuals. And, and, and those um, were sort of legitimate um, actual cases. And I think there's a lot of reasons why someone might not want to go through that full authorized you know, uh, status of reporting something to Twitter. And so I think that's a big opportunity for bystanders. Okay, so that's time. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks to the panel and the organizers of Theorizing the Web. It was great.